So we've got Dr. Sean Baker on the line here and very, very uh, happy to have him on. So I'll just give a quick introduction, right? So basically Sean Baker, he, he's an athlete, he's a, he's a father, he's a world record holder, right? And he's a massive uh, advocate of the, you know, the carnivore diets. So, you know, he was the chief of orthopedic trauma as well. I'm, I'm just going to, you know, run through some of the stuff I've learned about Sean. Um, so, yeah, so basically he's a chief, he was the chief of orthopedic trauma um, out in Afghan, uh, 2007 to my knowledge. Um, there's just a massive list. Played semi-pro rugby, you know, faced off against some of the All Blacks. Uh, he was first place strongest man, if I've got that right, in 2004 in Texas. Uh, American record deadlift holder as well. I think that was back in 2000. 350 kgs, drug free as well. I'd like to uh, drop that one in there because that's important. <laughs> and not to mention as well, he was a two times uh, concept indoor rowing world record holder. And again, lifetime drug free. Um, so yeah, I could keep going forever. But um, how you doing, Sean? Anyway, man, it's great to have you on. Yeah, well, well, thanks for that nice introduction, and uh, I'm doing well. It's a, it's a nice day here, and uh, it's good to be able to talk to you. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So, yeah, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a bit of a run through, um, I know I just kind of covered the highlights of your <laughs> of your achievements and stuff like that, but um, I just wanted to see if you could give us a quick insight into you know who you are and what you're all about, basically, Sean. Yeah, well, I mean, as you mentioned, I'm, you know, I'm a physician, I was a trainer as an orthopedic surgeon. So I spent a significant portion of my career, you know, fixing broken people, you know, fi replacing joints, you know, doing sports, medicine treatments, you know, fixing tendons and ligaments and, and, and uh, uh, healing broken bones. And I did my time as a trauma surgeon during the, you know, during the Af Afghan conflict. And, uh, and, and so that's kind of my sort of background. But I've always been, you know, as I said, I've always been an athlete, I've competed in numerous sports, I still you know, I'm still a competitive athlete today, even though I'm, you know, in my mid fifties. So I, I've, I've kind of always prized uh, performance and, and uh, fitness and health. Uh, and um, I got really interested in nutrition about, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago. And I've been kind of on this nutritional learning journey ever since. And, uh, you know, I kind of found some things that, you know, maybe, maybe don't align with what most people believe or think or have been taught or what our sort of uh, nutritional I don't know, experts uh, uh, tell us. Uh, and so I've been playing with, you know, what's, you know, what was known as a carnivore diet, which is uh, the term that I actually kind of came up with when I wrote my book. And, uh, you know, we've just seen some really, really neat stuff happening with people that are, that are kind of realizing that meat is not a, it's not a bad food. It's not, it's, it's actually a, a very healthy food to eat. And, and so uh, that's been an interesting thing. And I've been out there, you know, kind of, trying to get that information out to as many people as possible. I think the, the, the over me, overlying message or underlying main message I have is that, you know, when it comes to health and nutrition and disease, uh, we are not really focused in the right direction. I mean, we're, we're seeing, you know, this ever increasing push towards pharmacy, pharmaceuticals and drug for this, drug for that, even in the midst of this pandemic, we're completely um, minimizing the impact of, of improving one's health their host factors in lieu of you know let's just everybody take a drug um and so i have uh, you know I, 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 with with everything i do i try to say you know you need to focus on these things we, we could literally um completely turn the direction around with with this chronic disease epidemic which, which is only getting worse it gets worse and worse every year instead we are now kind of accepting it you know we've got this positive body positivity obesity is beautiful and it's not to say these these people should be shunned or denigrated in any way, but I mean, we, we should not glorify disease I and mean, we can accept that it happens and, and, and try to realize that people are dealing with that, but to, to sort of almost promote it. And, and then of course the, the, the solution for that is just don't worry about your disease. We got a pill for that. You can just kind of continue on in your unhealthy ways and behaviors and we'll just continue to medicate you. I think that's, uh, that is clearly the wrong message. Uh, unfortunately it doesn't, yeah, you know, it's it sells well. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, a lot of money to be made in that. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Yeah, because obviously, you know, people being willing to change their nutrition, change their behaviors of food, change their lifestyle, always the approach is well for the most part is like take this pill, right, Sean? So, talk us through your experience, uh, real briefly with me as well. I actually about a year ago 
I was eating probably 60, 70% uh, plants. I was still eating a decent amount of meat and good quality meat sources, but gut issues. Um, couldn't get to the bottom of it for years. Really frustrating as well because, you know, I've been fit, healthy, you know, an athlete as well, um, competing at a high level and stuff like that. And yeah, that was the one issue that I couldn't shake off. Gut issues, skin issues as well. Long story short, removed, you know, the more toxic kind of plants out of my diet. And now I eat animal based. I don't eat, you know, full carnival like yourself, but it's been life changing for me in terms of my energy, my mental clarity, even my libido has shot up even more. Uh, but the most important thing was my gut health. And obviously, Sean, you know how important gut health is. So it's been life changing for me. And thanks to your information. Um, I've just ordered your book now as well. I need to read your book, The Carnivore. Uh, the carnivore diet, but yeah, I mean, it's really, sh it really shined the light on the fact that actually, when you when you kind of peel everything back and all the information we've got, you know, meat is by far hands down, not even you know in competition with anything else, uh, the most nutrient dense food on the planet, right? So, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a quick insight into your journey, mate, with the you know your personal journey in terms of uh, the way you eat now, and then maybe you know some of the stuff you've experienced with people that you've helped. I've seen some of your transformations and. Uh, you know, in terms of people just literally life-changing uh, transformations with people. So, yeah. Um, so like you, I ate a, you know, kind of a, a mixed diet for most of my life. And I'm, uh, you know, like I said, a very competitive, highly successful mm -hmm. athlete. And somewhere in my, I guess, you know, I'm in my mid fifties now, but in my early forties, I started to see that I was starting to develop, you know, quote unquote signs of aging. I was getting old and I didn't really like that. You know, I was, my back was hurting. I was, you know, I wasn't sleeping well. My blood pressure was going up. I probably was becoming uh, pre-diabetic. In fact, um, all those things were, were going on. And so I, I took it upon myself to start looking into nutrition because I was already exercising. It wasn't like I was, you know, just sitting on the couch. I was training extremely hard. And when, I mean, I actually, in that condition, I actually managed to win a world championship in Highland Games, you know, throwing these, putting on a kilt, Scottish kilt and throwing all this stuff around. And so I was performing still at a high level in training that way, but the nutrition part of it, I really wasn't focusing on. I mean, I, I ate plenty of protein, I ate plenty of meat, I ate plenty of food. I didn't need a lot of junk, but despite that, I was still seeing um, these issues going on. And so I, you know, I went on this journey and I went through all different types of dietary variations and experiments and saw what worked the best. I mean, I did try the low fat, you know, mostly vegetable type of approach, which many people are advocates of. And, and, and yes, indeed, I did lose weight but I mean, I was just miserable. I mean, I absolutely felt miserable. I was tired. I was hungry. I was cold. I was irritable. No one wanted to be around me. The nurses at the hospital were like, we much like the fat Dr. Baker way better, you know, because you're kind of being an ass. <laughs> and it was true. And so I, I, uh, I, I started to shift my focus and I started including more, some more fat in the diet and more animal foods. And Eventually, you know, after you know, doing low carb stuff for, for several years, I, I stumbled across a group of people that were doing this all meat crazy carnivore meat based diet. they called it a zero zero they called it a zero carb diet and I, I i thought it was bizarre i thought it was weird i thought it was crazy it seemed it but it was interesting and so i, I kind of just kind of dug and delved more into it and, and kind of questioned some of these folks and, and kept an open mind and after about know, six months of, of, of kind of observing this i said well let me just try it and so I tried it, you know, for a couple of days and I was like, well, that's not bad. I, I kind of like steak and eggs. It's pretty good. I don't mind bacon and that type of stuff. And so that's what got me into it. And then, uh, you know, I, I kept going back to that and going longer and longer. And eventually I got to where I did it for a full month. And at the end of the month, I mean, throughout the month, I was like really impressed at how good I felt. You know, I had uh, things that had really kind of bothered me. I mean, and, and the digestive part was one of the first things I noticed, you know, before, I mean, you know, I had digestion, which I thought was normal human digestion, you know, a little bit of bloating, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And then that all went away 100% completely. And it was like, I didn't even notice I had eaten food anymore. There was no perception of digestion whatsoever. That was eye opening to me. And so when the 30 days were over, um, I went back to my more mixed omnivorous diet, and I immediately started to feel bad. I mean, everything that had gone away immediately came back. So at that point, I made a decision that, you know, I'm going to go continue doing this for, for, for a longer period of time. And then it went to 60 days and then three months and six months and a year. And I remember my girlfriend at the time goes, how long are you going to do this? And I said, well, I'm only going to do it for a year. <laughs> then I got to two years and three years and so on and so forth. Wow. And, um, and so now I'm about five years into this. And, uh, 
uh, that was my journey. And then so along the way, I was on you know social media talking about this stuff. And it was kind of a joke, you know, hey, aren't you, you're going to die of a heart attack. You're going to, you know, you're going to get scurvy because you're not eating vitamin C enough. And you're going to have, uh, you know, your colon's going to die because you don't have any fiber in there. And, and of course, none of those things happened. And uh, for whatever reason, I inspired a bunch of other people to try it. And so we actually did a kind of an organized sort of experiment. We did a 90 day trial. We had like, I think a hundred people that had volunteered to go for 90 days and we recorded everything. We recorded, you know, as much information as we could from those people. And, you know, with basically out exception, every one of them had tremendously good results and they'd lost on average something like 30 pounds in 90 days and eight inches off their weight or eight centimeters off their waist. And I mean, their, heart, their resting heart rate went down and all the subjective markers. How do you feel? How's your sleep? How's your libido? How's your digestion? How's your skin on and on? Everything got better tremendously. So I said, well, there's something really here. Uh, and so, you know, I continued on this path, eventually formed a company with, with somebody else who had been uh, affected by this. And we, we named this company MeetRx, you know, Meet is Medicine, basically. And then we developed this huge community. Of, and we've got literally thousands and thousands of people now that have all seen similar results, you know, like people that have, you know, literally lifelong diseases, you know, things like multiple sclerosis and, um, you know, certainly diabetes and obesity and arthritis and back pain and some of the mental health disorders, bipolar disorder, anxiety, PTSD. I mean, just about everything you can think of that's, that's chronic in nature. I've seen at least someone get dramatically better by, by using this. And so, that is kind of where we were now. We, we, there's kind of an evolution in where, where we're going. You know, we're seeing some patterns starting to emerge that, you know, certain people, you know, whether they're it's based on their age or their sex or their maybe their ethnicity or where they're located in the world or what their lifestyle is like, seem to tolerate things better than others when, when we're talking about things. In addition to meat, certain people have different different requirements. And so we're trying to figure that out. So that's kind of the that's where we're headed at this point because we want to we want to make it as accessible as everybody first I, I i'm fairly convinced that a carnivore diet as an elimination diet is very effective for just a tremendously num high number of people for a high number of diseases and issues not everybody needs to do it and not everybody wants to do it and so we want to figure out what works you know with the least restriction as possible i suppose and the thing that makes it more sustainable now some people are just completely happy just eating nothing but you know, I got a guy that, I mean, he's ground beef and bacon every meal, every day. He's been doing it for three years and he's as happy as a, happy as can be. Doesn't care. Doesn't want to change anything. And it's fine. He's doing great. And there's other people that, you know, they, they, they're happy to, you know, add in a piece of fruit or something like that, or an avocado. And we would just try to figure out what's going to work for them. What's not. So yeah, that's the deal right now. Yeah. Yeah. No, I see what you mean. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. I've seen, you know, on your page and stuff, some of the, you know, just some of the stuff you post with, you know, the text and stuff that people have sent you, it's just unbelievable. Right. Because as you say, with all the immune, and that's another kind of thing we're facing now, right. With, with chronic disease is the obesity epidemic. Yes. Heart disease. And I believe like immune, immune issues now uh, are kind of just behind that. Right. So like immune illness is flying up right on a global scale. So, Mate, that was um, really good for clearing that up. I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you in terms of like me, because this is an issue I get, Sean, right, with clients. And the funny thing is, even myself, right? So I was eating a decent amount of, say, good quality grass-fed red meat anyway, right? Prior to about a year ago when I uh, transitioned more into animal-based. So now I just eat some fruit. I don't eat any vegetables. I just eat fruit uh, like you know, berries, avocado, red meat. I eat offal as well. So I get a decent amount of kind of beef liver in and whatnot. Um, and I have some bone broth here in there. So it's quite balanced, but I was always worried. And even me in my head, I was worried about like red meat. You know, I had this thing in my head, like maybe not more than three or four times you shouldn't eat it because just, I just didn't know what was going on in my head personally, because the bottom line is like, anyway, I wanted to ask you because I have with clients, for example, I've had, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a transformation coach. So I was a personal trainer for years, but now my business is online and I help people a lot with nutrition now. Right? So some of my clients, Sean, you know, um, they've gone to the, they've been getting great results. They've got leaner. They feel so much better, you know, energy levels, they're stronger, everything else. Then they go to the doctors and have a checkup and the doctor, I'm sure you've heard this many a times, the doctor will say to them, you know, your cholesterol levels are really, really high. You've got to be very careful. And then they'll come to me and they'll say, look, I'm going to have to cut meat out. I'm going to have to reduce my eggs and, uh, you know, egg yolks and stuff like that. And I'll try and communicate to them, you know, 
But the bottom line is, man, I wanted to ask you, saturated fat, cholesterol, these things that, you know, a lot of us are conditioned to still think are bad. <clears throat> Talk to us about that a bit, Sean, if you don't mind, because uh, it's a bit of a frustration with mine, uh, of mine, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I think the first thing is uh, when we sort of look at these sort of various biomarkers and their associations with diseases, we have to remember that, that uh, we don't, unequivocally know that the relationships are always, you know, this, the associations always hold true in every single population, you know, um, like you said, you know, these people, they get, you know, so if we look at, I don't think health moves in disparate ways. I think you get healthy or you don't get healthy. You know, you get sicker as you get sicker, you know, we see people's body composition gets where they, they, they replace lean mass with fat tissue. You know, they, they, they become fatter. Their inflammatory markers usually increase their blood glucose control uh, gets worse. Their um, uh, triglycerides may elevate. They may see fat deposition in their organs, you know, fatty liver disease, fatty pancreas disease, fat within the muscle tissue. Blood pressure may go up, you know, they're, and then all the clinical symptoms. They're tired, they're fatigued, you know, their their skin looks blotchy or their, you know, their teeth are having problems. All these things go in the same direction, right? You know, it's rarely to see somebody that's perfectly healthy with one aspect and everything else is garbage. It's usually, a, there's usually a consistent pattern. And so when I see people that start out, you know, maybe 50 kilos overweight and they're pre-diabetic or diabetic and they're depressed and their joints hurt and, you know, their blood glucose control is poor and they, everything and the blood pressure is high and everything gets better, all of it gets better. And the only thing that goes the other way is cholesterol. Then you have to ask yourself, in that particular situation, is that cholesterol really a problem like we think it is? You know, are you going to tell me you, you do better as a big fat guy with poor blood glucose and inflammation, high blood pressure for, for heart disease than you would have as a lean guy with none of that stuff and a million differences, your LDL cholesterol? I find that hard to believe just from a, just from a you know, plausibility standpoint, you know, when we talk about disease. But I, I think that, um, you know, we're coming to find out that, you know, and, and many physicians still are gosh, three decades behind, um, that, you know, LDL cholesterol, total cholesterol are really imprecise and, and, and maybe not even that strong of markers for predicting cardiovascular disease. Even though there's a lot of associational data going back many years, it shows that but we're seeing more and more that there's, there's subfractions and there's different sort of scenarios, whether, the, whether the, the cholesterol is oxidized or not oxidized, the particle size, um, you want to know things like, uh, uh, they, like advanced lipid protein, you know, advanced lipoprotein uh, testing where you can look at the insulin resistance scores and things like that. I really like that, you know, because we see people with very high cholesterol, but when you actually examine their arteries, you know, you look at their neck or you look at their heart, they're, they're pristine typically. And so why do we have this um, uh, variation there? It should be a con a consistent across the board. And so is there a population of people that are healthy that can have high cholesterol? I think there is. I think, you know, I think that's, that's probably uh, likely to be seen. There's some studies that are, I know that at least there's one study that's looking at that that hasn't been uh, finished yet, but it's, it's in works to look at people with very high cholesterol and see what happens to their, to their, to their vessels. Um, we know that the vast majority of people that have heart attacks don't have high cholesterol. They have normal to low cholesterol, uh, but there are people that have a high, high cholesterol too. So, you know, you, have, you can have a heart attack at any level of cholesterol. It doesn't really matter. Uh, so I, you know, like I said, I, I don't think you should ignore cholesterol in certain situations. It's probably very problematic. You know, I think it's part of the, you know, I look at it like this, you know, if, if I'm going to build a fire, I need at least three ingredients. I need something to burn, you know, uh, uh, so wood, I need an environment, oxygen, so air, and then I need fuel, you know, so fire. So there's three ingredients. And if I don't have all three of those, I can put you know, uh, wood on the ground all day long, if there's no oxygen or spark, it's never going to turn into a fire. So I think the same thing with cholesterol. If you don't have those underlying um, issues, and, and some of those issues would be vascular damage, endothelial damage, then you're not going to see cholesterol being deposited. And then the environment might be, you know, do we have chronic inflammation or hyperglycemia or some of those things? You know, one of the, one of the, there was a recent study looking at uh, the Women's Health Study, looking at something like 50,000 people, and they show that the number one predictor for cardiovascular disease, you know, was at a rate of, you know, an odds ratio of eight or 800 percent increase was um, diabetes, or I think it might have been 10,000 percent. 
LDL cholesterol in that same study showed about a 37% increase. So you've got a thousand percent increase in risk versus a, a 38% increase in risk, which is really kind of minimal, quite honestly. So I, I just, uh, you know, I think, it, I think when anybody has that information, your doctor should at least look for more information, you know, because you can, you, can, you, can, you can plug in something as simple as a MESA calculator, multi-ethnicity uh, study on atherosclerosis, MESA calculator, you can plug in your numbers and you can see what your, your risk is. Like for mine, for instance, the, well, that's kind of funny. I checked my cholesterol, well, I don't know, a month ago. My total cholesterol was 237 uh, milligrams per deciliter U.S. numbers. And when I plug in all my stuff into the MESA calculator, um, my risk for, cardio, for having a cardiovascular event in the next 10 years was 2%. If I could take my cholesterol and bring it all the way down to 100 and make the vegan doctor super happy, my risk would go from 2.2% to like 1.6%. So it's like a 0.6% difference. Yeah. It's like, is it worth it to me? You know, and, and, you know, the other thing that would happen is my HDL would drop if I did that. So it would, it would you know, it would further make that not that, that worthwhile. And then again, I talk about most of these studies, when we're looking at cholesterol, we're worried about cardiovascular disease. And while it's true cardiovascular disease is, is, is the disease that kills most people or kills the most number of people, you're going to die of something at some point. You know, you're, if you don't die of cardiovascular disease, you're going to die of cancer. If you don't die of cancer, you're going to die of, you know, an infection or violent crime or suicide or, you know, any other, you know, some neurodegenerative disease or any of those things. And so who's to say, what you're going to die of, what you won't even want to die. I mean, you know, if it was up to me, drop dead of a heart attack sounds a hell of a lot better than, you know, dying of friggin', you know, lung cancer or something like that. So, I mean, it's one of those things where um, I look at, you know, all cause mortality. Because when you look at all, all cause mortality curves, there's a great study out of Korea published in 2019, uh, looking at 12 million people. This is one of the largest studies that's ever been done. And they showed that, you know, there was a very nice J shaped curve. The cholesterol, when your cholesterol is very, very low, like below 120 total cholesterol, the odds of you dying of anything was something like 250% higher. And then, it, then when it got down to 210 to 240, it was the lowest it was at. And then as it, then as it went up towards 300, it increased a little bit, but maybe, maybe 30%. So hmm. I think, you know, like I said, if your goal is to live, then I'm not convinced that you have to you have to necessarily have the cholesterol as low as possible. I think there's other things that matter, and I think at the end of the day, I mean, I, I'm going to say I don't know what makes people live longer. I really don't. I don't think because I don't think anyone knows. And I think if, if you if you use that as your operating framework, then the other thing is what what other worthy goals can I have? Well, I would say, why don't we work on quality of life? Why don't we feel good? Why don't we enjoy the time we have on Earth, however long it may be? not be burdened with disease, function well, feel well. And if that's our goal, then perhaps our recommendations look very differently. And as you pointed out yourself, if you're running around with gut pain all the time or your friends are obese and have pain and that goes away, to me, that's, I think that's a worthy goal. And I think that's, honestly, that's probably all we're able to do with, with, with you know, and, and to actually say with any confidence. I mean, I know if I've got a, if I've got a patient that is diabetic taking medications, and I can make them so they don't need to take any medication anymore. That's a win. That's clear. That is, that's not speculating what you're going to die of in 30 years, which is always, I mean, it's like astrology as far as I'm concerned. hundred percent. I actually had that with a, with a client as well. He was pre-diabetic and then obviously as he got leaner, healthier, prioritized the important things such as just eating more whole foods, um, you know, getting good sleep and all the rest of it. And obviously, you know, just training properly and stuff like that. Obviously, he then, you know, he was no longer pre pre diabetic. You know, those markers improved drastically. But then, obviously, his cholesterol um, was was a little bit higher, or whatever. So, yeah, taking nothing away from doctors as well. I wanted to put that out there. You know, I'm definitely definitely not a doctor, right? But um, you know, just I wanted to clear that up because I think it's an important thing uh, for people to know that it's actually context, right? Sean, I think think that's what you're trying to say. There's a lot of context, uh, I guess. Um, you know contextual variants or whatever from person to person. And it's, it's a trade off to how healthy you are in general, right? Like you said at the start, you're either, you're either going one way, you're getting healthier, you're feeling better. You know, you'll notice that as well because of how you feel, how you perform and how you look, uh, or you're not really. So, um, yeah, I like the way you, uh, summed that up. So when it comes to vegetables, Sean, um, obviously I still get, when I say to people, I don't eat vegetables anymore. 
they're like, wow, someone said to me recently, wow, I'm, I'm really shocked about that. I, I thought you would have eaten your veggies, you know? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I used to eat, I used to be the guy, Sean, who would eat like bowls of broccoli and cauliflower, loads of olive oil, just on its own, you know? Um, but yeah, nowadays, because I don't, vegetables, you talked about uh, vitamin C and you've talked about this many a times. I've looked into <clears throat> lots of your research and the studies you've shared. Uh, vitamin C, obviously fiber, antioxidants. They're the three things that I get a bit of pushback on myself. You need those things in your diet. You know, you need to have vegetables to get those things in. Um, talk us through the vegetable thing, if you don't mind, uh, Sean. I'm sure you get a lot of people asking you about this. Oh, you don't eat any vegetables. You know, you're going you're gonna to die early. You're going to die young. Yeah, I mean, so I think, you know, we have this sort of uh, belief that vegetables are the healthiest thing we can possibly eat, and we need to eat loads of them. And, and you know, as long as we're eating lots of vegetables, we're going to have tremendous health. And, and in reality, we see a lot of people that eat a lot of vegetables, and they end up having some significant health challenges. Now, I will say that I think vegetables and fruits and fruits and vegetables are a better food choice than much of what you find in the grocery store. Most of the, you know, all the ultra processed food, all the, you know, foods with all these, you know, highly uh, new ingredients, you know, I, you know, anytime we're eating soybean oil and high fructose corn syrup and artificial flavors and coloring, I don't think that's a good idea, quite honestly, or at least not having that in, in great quantities in the diet. And so if you're eating a lot of fruits and vegetables, usually it means two things. Usually it means number one, um, you care about your health, and so you don't eat the junk food. And number two, it often means you're fairly wealthy, um, you know, at least certainly in Western countries, you know, because fruits and vegetables are tend to be more expensive, particularly if you're eating the organic ones, than the chips and crap, you know. And, and so anytime you look at populations that are eating more fruits and vegetables, you're saying, I'm looking at people that care about their health that have more money. And so automatically, you've now just put them in a more favorable light, you know, and I think that's something that, you know, they try to uh, uh, correct for that with multivariate analysis, but I don't think they necessarily do it. Do, you know, the correction is whatever they think it might be. You know, they'll, they'll fudge the numbers anyway. They, well, we think social economic status is worth 20%, so we're going to, but it could be 50%. And it may, you know, we don't really know that thing with the multivariate analysis, quite honestly. Um, so I don't necessarily think fruits or vegetables are necessarily bad or harmful for, for, for people, but I will say there are people in which it does cause harm. And I, I, that's just the reality of, of the observation. This is why you have practicing clinicians that make observations in the field. And you can't just discount that and say, well, you know, I, I've got 5,000 people that told me when they were eating, you know, whatever vegetables, they had some kind of digestive problem or they had some sort of issue. And when they removed it, it went away and it goes away reliably. It comes back every time I reintroduce it. So you have to at least acknowledge that that's going on. Now, why that may be, um, I think, you know, I think there's some evidence that our gut function has been compromised and it's getting worse, you know, as a, as a population, as individuals over the last several decades, as our food quality has gotten lower and lower and lower and we're eating more and more things, which I don't think are necessary things we are, well adapted to eating. So we have a compromised gut. And now this compromised gut, which in maybe decades past could have easily handled asparagus and broccoli. Now for some people, it just doesn't even handle that anymore. And so I think, I do think that meat is a superior food. I think, you know, it's clear that it's easier on our gut for sure. For most people, the way, even if you look at the way our, our anatomy is set up I and mean, we are, we are set up uh, primarily as a protein and fat eating species. I mean, we do have the capacity to eat carbohydrates and fiber is something that we can derive a small amount of caloric nutrition from, but is, but is certainly not our priority. You know, if we look at, um, say for instance, for fiber, you know, our capacity to uh, ferment and digest fiber uh, from a comparative anatomy standpoint, you know, if we, if we look at like say a chimpanzee or a gorilla and you know, other primates, they have something like 50 to 60 percent of their gut is dedicated to fermenting and breaking down fiber. The human gut only has about 15 to maybe 18 percent of our gut dedicated to that. That's identical to what a cat or a dog has pretty much. They're both in that 15 to 18 percent range. So, you know, our diet probably could mimic that of a cat or a dog. And if we, you know, if we ask what, well, certainly what cats eat, they're going to be heavily animal based. You know, they cats surprisingly. You know, we always we would all agree a cat's a carnivore. I don't think anyone out there would disagree with that. However, 
cats eat cat food that's dry cat food. And a lot of it has grains and stuff like that. And they can process up to something like a, a diet of 60% carbohydrate. Cats can actually eat a 60% carbohydrate based diet and still survive, even though they're carnivores. And, and so funnily enough, human beings are often eating a 60% carbohydrate grain based diet. Uh, even though we probably are what I would call facultative carnivores. I mean, we are obligated, we are opportunistic omnivores, meaning to say we'll eat whatever the hell we can find. And if Twinkies would have grown on a tree 100,000 years ago, you can be damn sure humans would have been eating them. But, you know, what we could get and what was available to us, you know, particularly as we evolved was clearly a lot of meat. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, you know, if you, if you, if you think about how humans, evolved and spread out across the globe. You know, if, we, if the argument is we ride, rose somewhere, maybe Eastern Africa or some part of Africa, so it always goes back and forth. But, and then we kind of, as, as we kind of became you know, Homo erectus, you know, we, they were the first ones to kind of leave Africa, we believe. You know, they crossed Southern Europe and Asia, and then eventually we kind of came back and mixed in Europe, and then we, then we kind of went from Asia to, across the land bridge to, to North America, South America, and eventually we colonized the, you know, Australia and the Pacific Islands. Um, we survived and we are the most diverse species on the planet as far as geography. And the only reason we can do that is not because we had to eat some super berry because there's no super berry that grows in all those places. The only thing that, 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 that you can find food wise in all of those different places throughout the world are animal foods. You know, there's some kind of meat and, and incidentally humans, you know, if, if you go outside and look around, there's pretty much not a single animal that you can eat. I mean, every animal is on the menu, but, 90, something like 98, 99% of all plants on the planet are not edible. They will either kill you or make you very sick. Uh, so, I mean, it's one of those things you can't make the argument that we're requiring to eat plants if that plant or those plants don't grow everywhere. I mean, the only plant I think micro in most places might be grass. You know, you can probably find grass most places in the world, but I would, you know, you can't eat it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, unless you you're a dog. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it makes it even makes dogs sick. <laughs> yeah, the dog didn't get sick on that. So I mean, you know, I think it's it's uh, uh, you know, if you just kind of look at it from a from a just a common sense macroscopic view, uh, and discount some of the nutritional science, which I think is just unfortunately, I think our nutrition science is not very scientific. I mean, I know there's scientists and PhDs and people that dedicate their lives to that, but it's it's just almost impossible to do good medical or, or nutritional research in people and, and make valid claims about longevity and, and health outcomes. I just, I just don't think we can, we can really do that. Yeah, hundred percent. And um, thanks for clearing that up as well in terms of fruit and vegetables, not being necessarily demonized. I didn't want to come on here and kind of, you know, demonize vegetables and fruit. Uh, it's just to make people aware of the fact that, you know, animal based foods, which we're going to just delve a bit deeper into now quickly, uh, are actually the most nutrient dense foods you can eat all in all, providing, you know, it's good quality. Uh, so fruit and vegetables, I've got lots of clients who do really, really well. Their gut's totally fine eating vegetables and fruit, you know, fills them up more because of the fiber on top of the protein and they're doing really, really well. So like I said, you know, there's, there's so much individual variance as well, Sean, right? From person to person, like you said, when it comes to diet and metabolism, right? So that's why it's kind of, you got to, you know, to, in a sense, figure things out for yourself. Like you said, you've been doing with clients, Sean, as well, right? You're still trying to figure out, you know, who does better, you know, with some fruit in their diet or whatever, because sustainability is obviously, you know, really important as well, as you, as you touched on. So in terms of meat then, Sean, just talk us through like the most kind of nutrient dense foods you would say, um, meat, uh, especially or animal based foods that you have in your diet as a staple and that maybe you kind of recommend to people you work with. Yeah, I, well, I mean, I think the first thing, you know, it doesn't matter how nutrient dense a food is if no one's going to eat it. So you have to, you have to account for palatability, right? So, I mean, I know a lot of people are big proponents of awful or organ meats and they'll say, you know, we need you to eat this much liver and this much kidney and this much thymus and brain and, and you know, on and on and on. And so uh, I certainly recognize that, you know, there are some uh, unique concentrations of nutrients in these certain certain things. I personally don't eat much in the way of awful at all. I, I eat almost none. Um, and I've been doing that for five years now. I've had it from time to time just to, just to experiment to see if it makes a difference. And I've been underwhelmed at, at any effect that it's had on me anyway. And I've, I've, I've consistently found it not to be that tasty. So I tend not to eat it. I mean, I think that when it comes to um, nutrition in general, I think 
uh, meat from a ruminant animal. This is a grazing animal with the you know the four chambered stomach like a cow or a sheep or or you know some of the wild animals, elk, deer, bison, tend to be perhaps more nutritious, certainly more satiating. You know, I think again, if we go back to our our, our historical or ancestral roots, um, when it came to hunting, you know, and I, I alluded to Homo erectus, well, they, they started hunting and they had a spear. I mean, that's all they had as their technology. And that's all they, quite honestly, that's all they really needed. They didn't need to develop any more technology. Technology is usually, you know, the mother of invention is necessity. And since they had spears and they had big, fat, juicy animals they could stick them in, they were good. They didn't need to develop anything. And so they, they and they, and, and the, the evidence indicates that they ate a lot of, particularly these things called propsidians. So these would be these elephants and mastodons and mammoths. That was their food of choice. They would kill them. And it wasn't hard for them to do it because elephants and, and, and they don't see humans as threats typically, or at least uh, most of them didn't particularly early on because, you know, they're, you know, we're, they're, they're a hundred times bigger than us, right? They're yeah. 12,000 pounds and a human is 150 pounds. And so, um, so when you go back to hunting, you would have selected those big animals. And so you're thinking about, well, what about like chicken or something like that? Well, chicken's a bird. How hard is it to kill a bird with a spear? And how much work do you have to do when, you know, relative to killing a mammoth for how much meat you can get? So it's kind of an optimal foraging or, or hunting strategy. If I have to spend three hours killing and butchering, or bitch butchering an elephant and I can get 4 million calories or whatever it's going to be, would I choose that or would I want to, how long would it take me to get the equivalent in chicken? I mean, it would probably take me three years to, to chase all those chickens down and kill them. And so that's what he, I think there's pretty clear evidence. That's what humans selected to do and, and preference to do. And so I think our evolution was based upon that. So ruminant meat, fattier meat, probably, you know, I think, you know, again, in the, in the absence of, of a lot, a lot of carbohydrate, you need to get energy from somewhere. Um, there's a nice paper that Mickey Bendor and uh, uh, maybe Rob, I can't remember the other author, Rob, Rob Barker or something out of Tel Aviv, just published last year looking at, you know, human evolution. And so around, they're projecting around 80,000 years ago, our, our, our supply of these big giant animals started to dry up for whatever reason. Many people will point to over hunting, but because of that, we then were forced to select smaller animals because that was all that was left. And so, because of that, we had, we had to evolve our hunting techniques. And so range technology, atlatls and bow and arrows and things we could project out uh, started to develop. And so now we've got, you know, we're chasing these smaller animals around. There's not as much fat. It's harder to get as much energy. You know, we still had the protein was still there, but the energy was lacking. And so then we started to turn towards more um, of our calories coming from uh, plant sources. And so, and then eventually that culminated in, kind of the development of agriculture around 10, 12,000 years ago. And unfortunately for the human species, well, I guess it depends on you are. I mean, that, that allowed the development of civilization as we know it, but the, the negatives to that were, you know, we took a big hit individually from our individual health. I mean, our, our brains actually shrunk by about 200 cc's. Our stature, we became about six inches shorter. Our dental health got worse. Our bone structure got weaker. We lost muscle. So, I mean, we became a more frail species and weaker, weaker species, despite the fact that we've landed a man on the moon and all this great stuff that civilization and collective intelligence has allowed us to do. But individually, we, we became uh, compromised, you know, compared to what we were, you know, maybe 125,000 years ago. Mm, makes sense. Makes sense. Just a couple more things I wanted to clear up with you quickly, Sean. And the other one was like the environment thing. It's another thing I find it, I'll be honest, I find it quite hard to convey uh, because, you know, we've got so much propaganda out there, right, Sean? Mm -hmm. As you've probably seen firsthand, right, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, the, the vegan community and plant-based and stuff like that. And then obviously with the environment debate as well. Talk us through that because I know it's a very complex, I know it's a very complex thing to talk about, but if you wouldn't mind just giving us your insight on, you know, cows, the worst thing for the environment, you know, you've got to stop eating them. Again, context. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a, that's that's been a very uh, you know I think this has been a, a very uh, important argument that the sort of the plant based community has co opted because they realize they're not selling it on the health you know because most people look at these vegans and they see that many of them look pretty sketchy as far as health goes. I mean, there's exceptions, but most of them don't look all that healthy. That we see that um, you know, from a, from an ethical standpoint, it's pretty easy to, to, to debunk the fact that, you know, Hey, look, I mean, you're, 
there's lots of animals that are dying in your food too. And, 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 you know, I mean, but I mean, the environmental aspect is, is their latest argument and they are getting now the support of major corporations and industry uh, because they're realizing that if they can convert people to an alternative protein source, you know, we see this at some of these, even these big meat companies are rebranding themselves as protein companies. And they are sort of adopting this, you know, we can turn peas or soybeans into meat, quote unquote meat, and we can tell people it's better for the environment and, and better for your health and on and on, the typical talking points. But the important point is we can make a hell of a lot more money than, than selling people beef because beef costs a lot of money to raise uh, and we got to pay the ranchers and, you know, it's, it's hard to automate and, and those types of things. And we've already sort of maxed out what we can do in some degrees with that. And we can, the, the scalability and the profitability margin on these synthetic and alternative sources of protein are much, much higher. So this is why we're seeing these arguments being played out in the media and the press and, you know, and celebrities and in and, and, and school and school and stuff like that are, are, are being pushed very hard. So you got to remember the, the reason behind it. It's not because everybody wants the world to go vegan. They could care less. They want to make a lot of money off your back and they don't really care about your health. I mean, anybody that, I mean, anybody who's not completely naive realizes that corporations don't care about people's health. They care about profits. That's all they care about. And that's what drives their, their strategies. Now they might paint it a certain way and pretend and masquerade and greenwash and health wash things just to, act like they pretend to care, but they, they actually don't really. Um, but yeah, as far as the, the environmental stuff, you know, we often hear that, you know, if you give up meat, you can save the planet from overheating because of climate change and all this stuff. And then they'll point to um, uh, data from 2006, a study called Live, Livestock's Long Shadow, in which they de depicted, uh, you know, cows being responsible, or well, sorry, animal agriculture being responsible for 14% of all greenhouse gases worldwide. And, you know, then they'll point to the transportation sector and it's also around 14 percent. And they'll say, well, my God, it's more than cows and planes and boats and trains and all this stuff combined. My God, you should just give up meat. So what they don't tell you is that, um, first of all, uh, that 14 percent number um, looks very different depending upon what parts of the world you're in. So when they use a, when they use a global number, like, for instance, in the United States, you know, where I live and in Australia, it's probably not too dissimilar uh, in the United States cows are responsible for 2% of our greenhouse gases. This comes straight from the Environmental Protection Agency. It's very solid numbers. It's been that way for decades. The numbers are always pretty consistent. Gas, you know, uh, uh, fossil fuels and uh, well, the, the, the industries that use fossil fuels, transportation industry and, and energy sectors, they make up 80% of our greenhouse gases. And so you're trying to say that that 2% me cutting back meat in the United States is going to make a 2% difference. In fact, I just talked with Frank Mittlauner, who's a, uh, he's a greenhouse gas uh, uh, expert, PhD from UC Davis. And he basically says that, you know, if every American in the United States were to go completely vegan and give up all of the meat and we got rid of all the cows, we'd have to kill all the cows, all 93 million cows and, you know, 9 million dairy cows and 9 million horses and 170 million cats and dogs. If we got rid of all of that and all of us gave up meat, the difference would only be a 2% reduction in our greenhouse gases in the United States. So it's, it's, it's almost pitiful. I mean, it's ridiculous, but they're going to play up these 14% numbers. And, and the reason it's so high is because most countries don't have much in the way of a transportation sector. There's not a lot of car, cars and highways and, and traffic in the middle of Namibia. You know, I mean, they've got cattle. So these numbers are higher because most of the countries are, are not developed. And so when you, when you look at it from that perspective and you understand um, where these numbers are actually coming from, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll, most of us are aware of, you know, China is pretty, pretty, putting out a tremendous amount of greenhouse gases. They're the world leading, the world leader in greenhouse gas emissions. I think India is right up there. And then the U.S. puts out a lot per capita because we're, we're not very uh, environmentally efficient, I suppose. Uh, although we've, we, we've shown reductions like no one else has in the last few years. Um, so that argument in me, to me is, is not particularly compelling. I mean, the argument about the greenhouse, uh, the, the, the Amazon rainforest is burning. Um, there's a lot of nuance into that, but I mean, the, the bottom line in the United States, the United States, about 0.5% of our beef comes from, from, from Brazil. 99.9, 9, 99.5% of the beef in the United States is not coming from Brazil, it has no impact on the, on the, on the Amazon rainforest. Um, you know, and, and why the forest is being cut down, number one, they need the wood, so lumber. The first reason they cut it down is get the wood, right? Wood is valuable for the, for the construction industry. And then they want to maybe 
plant other products in there. They'll plant in coffee and fruits and vegetables and all these foods and some soybeans, and soybeans for sure. And the soy um, is being first converted into human edible soybean oil. That's what they do. They, they press it for oil first. And then the leftover amounts are being shipped overseas, typically to China to feed their pigs. The cattle are not eating the soybeans. They're not, they're, they're not the reason. Now what they do is now they've cut down this forest and they'll put cattle in there and how to graze it. They kicked them out of the sugarcane producing country because before they were in the Cerrado grazing, you know, down south where the sugar canes were. And then they said, well, we need to grow a lot of sugar. So we're going to move the cows somewhere else. So let's stick them in the Amazon. So it's much more complicated. You know, the arguments around water, you know, always see, well, you know, if you eat one kilogram of beef, it takes 27 swimming pools of water to produce. You know, this is another, some crazy number like that. And what's actually occurring is that something like 98% of the water, depending on what part of the world you're in, is coming from rain. I mean, this is what they're calculating. So rain falls on the ground, falls on the grass, the cows eat the grass, therefore they took that water, right? Mm -hmm. The rain was gonna fall regardless. It's not like the, rain, the cows are out there doing a rain dance, making it fall. The rain <laughs> rains regardless. So, but they still count that in their calculation. That's like 98% of the water, water footprint. Um, so, I mean, when you look at just blue water, that's irrigation water that came from an aquifer, the numbers look much, much different, but they don't want to tell you that. And then if we start comparing actual nutrients, you know, if we look at lettuce water consumption based on grams of protein, you know, or, or something, you know, usable high quality nutrients, zinc or, or lysine, then it's not even a contest. And then cows even look, look super environmentally friendly. And then, and then that's not even to go to some of the things we do, you know, as far as, you know, regenerative style agriculture, which many people are doing has tremendous benefit for restoring the soil or for restoring the biodiversity. But there's other things that are being done. Uh, you know, Australia is one of the groups that pioneered us. You know, there's, there's additives you feed cattle and they can almost dramatically eliminate the methane production if we're worried about methane. And I think methane is overblown anyway, but if we're still going to say that's a problem, you can, you can, you can, you can cut out the methane production from a feed additives, any, any methane in the manure, you can suck the methane out of that using an, uh, an anaerobic digester and convert that into uh, biodiesel or fuel the, cow, the, the cars can drive around or you heat your home or something like that. So there are solutions that don't involve making everyone a malnourished vegan. You know, this is just, again, this, this whole environmental argument is, hey, look, we see a market opportunity. We were projecting that the alternative, you know, alternative meat or protein uh, market is going to be 150 million, 400, 150 billion, 400 billion by the year 2040, 2050. And so these companies are aggressively trying to get into that space and they're marketing and they're spending millions and millions of dollars, you know, paying people to re recycle their thing and try to convince you that, you know, the only thing you can do to save the planet is give up beef, you know, you know, don't turn your air conditioner down <laughs> two degrees to stop eating meat, you know, or so, you know, it's, it's just nonsense. But, but again, you know, it's propaganda, whoever, whoever, whoever wields the microphone, whoever has the loudest voice, whoever owns the media yep. uh, is going to own the message. And, you know, unfortunately people don't know better and they are, they're swayed by this. You know, the nice thing about it, you know, from a health standpoint is you can look in the damn mirror. I mean, you, you know, I mean, the climate change argument is tough for me to, to, to say because I can't, I look out the window and it's, you know, it's, you know, 75 degrees and sunny and looks great. Is it climate change? I don't know. I mean, I have to have somebody tell me if it's changing or not. Yeah. But for, with regard to my own health, I can literally walk in the mirror, wake up and say, how do I feel? What do I look like? You know, and it, so that argument is for me very easy because most people can, can intuitively tell that, but I can't tell you. Um, what's going on with the weather or the climate. I really, I'm not, you know, aside from the fact that I've been to many ranches and talked with many ranches and I've seen how they treat their animals. Most people have no idea what's going on with regard to ethics. You know, they're just like, all they're, they're seeing some, you know, cowspiracy or watch Dominion movie, these, you know, vegans. And, and, and then people, oh my God, that's what everybody does. And, but if you don't actually go talk to the people that raise your food and actually understand that you're never going to know, or you're going to see some propaganda film. And so, so yeah, that's that's the deal. That, with that, stuff. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and obviously you did share recently that it can actually be good for the environment if you if you're getting good quality pasture raised. As you said, you obviously know, you most likely know the people that you know produce your uh, you know you where you get your meat from and stuff like that. People who own the farms, and it's actually some research now I think to show as well that it actually can be good for the environment, right? Because it's like its own little ecosystem. Is that correct? Like, obviously, again, is context, but that, that can uh, be true. 
Well, absolutely. I mean, there are there are ranchers all over the world uh, that are demonstrating that every day that when they graze and pasture animals in a certain way, it 100% captures carbon. They they are net carbon negative. They are increasing biodiversity. The birds come back. The bees come back. The wild animals come back. The grasslands come back. The animals are not used, not exposed to. There's no herbicides or pesticides being used. The soil's not running off. Uh, you know, on and on and on, and they're more, and the animals are, uh, in in those situations, often more productive. Uh, they can run multiple species in the same land area of land, so they can conserve land. They they don't need to you know provide all these extra inputs. So so it's it, so it's not only better for the environment, but it's it's often more financially lucrative for the for the ranchers themselves once they get up to speed and running. But it may take a couple of years to to kind of turn things around. So that's that's one of the things that. Uh, you know, hopefully we'll see more support on a, on a legislative way so these people can get into this a little more easily. Mm. Last thing I wanted to ask you, Sean, is really, really funny, by the way. You know, the stuff that you share on your pages, you know, I find it hilarious, right? It's so funny, man. So I, was, I wanted to ask you how you deal with the pushback you get from, you know, the vegan community and stuff like that. Obviously, it's clear how you handle it, right? You, you laugh. You have a laugh or cry, right? And like I said, some of the stuff you share is so entertaining. But yeah, you must get a hell of a lot of uh, abuse and pushback. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't be able to handle it. I can't imagine. Uh, like, just would you be able to explain to us some of the pushback you get, um, some of the people attacking you and how you handle that? Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I First of all, I'll say 99% of the feedback I get is positive. I have so many people tell me, thank you for what you're doing, and thank you, you changed my life, and you've made a big difference in my health and all that stuff. And I get a lot of physicians, same thing. But there are, you know, some people that will come in there and say, you know, first of all, we think you smell bad, you're ugly, you know, you're fat, you're stupid, you know, well, you know, there's some stupid insult, and, and you know, we can't wait for you to have a heart attack, and on and on and on that, you know, we hope your soul roasts in hell and we hope your, your family dies. I mean, that, it's just nonsense. And, you know, and, and then sometimes I'll get just absolute nonsense. And sometimes I'll, I'll just turn it around and use it as a humorous post. I'll say, look, look at this, look what this knucklehead said. And, you know, and, and it's just, you know, it's, some of them are doing it just for attention. I have people tell me they're going to, they're going to find me in a dark alley and beat me to a pulp and say, okay, come on, bring it on. I want to see you in a dark alley, mate. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, you know, it's like, but I mean, that, that, that stuff doesn't bother me, but I'll tell you what does kind of bother me. This is something, you know, I was, I had been on Twitter for about six years and my account was suspended the other day. And the reason they gave me was, it was complete nonsense. It was like, you had a video from 2019 that had music in it that was copyrighted. So we're going to suspend your account, your account permanently. I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, the real reason is it, the message I've been putting out is countered or whatever kind of narrative they, they want to want to present there. And I think that is more disturbing. I don't care about the criticism. I'm happy to have criticism. I think we should have criticism. Yeah, yeah, if you're I, doing it right. I, well, I welcome that, and you should be able to refute it. If what you say is, is, it can stand on its, on its own and has merit, then, then you'll be able to defend that, and you'll be able to demonstrate with results, facts, or whatever, uh, which is what I, which I you know, generally am able to do. Um, but when when someone is like, well, we're not going to allow you to have a voice. And I think this is a very, uh, you know, serious topic. And I think this is something that, uh, I mean, we're seeing let this happen, you know, throughout the world, like no other time, you know, most of this is again around this COVID stuff, but I mean, you know, we're, we're seeing that trickle down to all aspects of, you know, uh, you know, what, what your thoughts are on pol politics or even health now. And I think that's, that's a, that's a grave disservice because I will tell you that, you know, there is no, settled science on nutrition at this point as far as i'm concerned i think most people would agree with that but there are people that i don't know why i mean i don't understand the the the, the, the reason why you'd want to not have a discourse or debate even if it's contentious even though even if even if it's nasty i think we should we we should be able to have that um i'm happy to see like i said i would be upset if sort of my vegan critics were silenced and not allowed to talk I, I would, I would literally would be, you know, I would be upset about that. If someone was told, Hey, we, we don't like your voice. Uh, I think that is, you know, like I said, that, that is, you know, again, I know this is not the topic of the show, but I think if we're going to live in a free society or have a free society, freedom of speech is, you know, obviously, obviously paramount, you know, it has to be, has to be there. And I think that's under threat right now. And, uh, 
Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anyway. So just, but anyway, the haters, are the haters I laugh at typically. It's usually, I, you know, I, I've been through, I mean, gosh, I mean, I've been, you know, I've been punched in the face. My head's been kicked in playing rugby. I've been in the middle of combat zones. I've had bad things that I've been exposed to. And some moron on a keyboard who's anonymous typing out some stupid sentence, sentence has little meaning to me whatsoever. And I don't really, if I can use it in a humorous way, that's about the only time I'll pay attention to it. Exactly. And just to clarify what I said at the beginning, right? Obviously, you're an orthopedic surgeon, you know, in, in Bagram Air Base, if I got that right, out in Afghan, you know, six, I read something like 600 surgeries in that one base alone, if I've got that right, in terms of frontline yeah. trauma. So, yeah, some of the stuff you've seen, like you said, a keyboard warrior is not really going to phase you. So, mate, just real quick, what would you say to people? Because you're almost 56 years old. Have I got that right, Sean? 55. I'm just I'm about to turn 55. So I'm, oh, you're about, sorry, mate. <laughs> about to turn 55. That's right. Yeah. All right. I thought you said you're about to say 56 or something. Okay. So, and obviously, you know, if you just look at Sean, for example, you can see that the shape he's in is insane. Also, you perform at a high, you know, you, you, you perform at a high level as an athlete still. We talked about, you know, just you're an athlete, right? Um, obviously, you know, you, you basically live and breathe what you preach, right? You're a picture of health. That's the bottom line. What would you say to people are the big rocks to focus on when it comes to health, getting in shape? What are the, if you strip everything back, what are the important things to really focus on, Sean, just to wrap it yeah, up? I mean, I, you know, I, I can say that with some, some level of, you know, experience behind me. I think, you know, you know, particularly younger, I mean, you would focus on lean mass and just getting stronger. I mean, I, I would do that. I would eat, you know, a decent amount of protein, probably more than you're eating currently and focus on that. And then I think, um, you know, I think that uh, just focus on, what it means to be healthy. And I, and I think, you know, your definition of health is probably the right definition for you. And I think, uh, you know, for me, absence of pain, you know, I think being able to function, all my systems are working well, um, you know, makes sense. And so don't get hung up in minutia. I mean, it's, it's very easy to get obsessed about what is my ketone level? Or what's my average blood glucose? Or what's my this or that lab? Because there's, there's always going to be new labs and ways to, to, to analyze stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, focus on the important things. Am I happy? Do I wake up with a smile? Do I have energy? I mean, those are the things that really are going to make your quality of life better. And I think, you know, if you spend your whole life trying to have a lab sheet where everything's in the green and you're obsessively doing that, your quality of life is probably going to be not what you would want. I mean, no one, I think no one is going to lie back on their deathbed and say, wow, I wish my LDL cholesterol was three points lower than it was or something. I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, kind of crazy. Enjoy life, focus on, you know, true health. And, and, you know, I, I think strength training is, is, is an essential part of, of what you want to do. It's going to, it's going to stead you well later on in life. If you can build up a strong base in your twenties and thirties, maybe in your forties, those last 40 or 50 years are going to be a hell of a lot better for you. Thanks a lot, Sean. I really, really appreciate your time, mate. That was awesome. Some great knowledge bombs there for the audience. And it was good to hear a bit more about who you are and what you're all about, Sean. Thanks a lot, mate. All right, Martin. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, buddy.